Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development, where we share original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We hope you join us often for practitioner-oriented content around all things related to leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page, and please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Guillaume Viat about considerations for the future of business, society, and the planet. Guillaume Viat, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. John, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. It's a pleasure to be with you. You're joining us from the Seattle area. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about really a big, fun topic, you know, considerations for the future of business, society, and the planet. We're not going to try to tackle too much here in 25 minutes, right? Just just <laughs> the future of business, society, and the planet. We're no, good. Um, no, but really, I think it's going to be a fun conversation. Some big ideas, some big topics we're going to be exploring. Um, but we also want to bring it down to the lived experience, you know, the day-to-day and how we can be better in our organizations for our teams as leaders, as we consider all these big macro level meta kind of uh, issues that we're going to be exploring together. As we get started, I wanted to share Guillaume's bio with everybody. Guillaume Viet is the author of Strategic Narrative, a simple method that business leaders can use to help everyone understand their businesses, get behind it, and believe in it. In his company, Meta Helm, he guides CEOs, founders, and business owners of transformative companies to align teams and accelerate innovation adoption. A wonderful, wonderful background that you have. I appreciate you taking the time to share your expertise and your experiences with me and my audience and to talk a little bit about your book and to explore this really important topic. Anything else you would like to share with the audience by way of your background, personal context before we dive on in further? Yeah, I, I think what's uh, the, the what what brings us together for this conversation john today is the uh the innovation piece i think of your podcast is it's really a it's a topic that i've been uh fortunately exposed to since i was a kid <laughs> i come from a family of entrepreneurs and innovation was always top of mind always in our conversation and always something i've worked on with uh with all my heart and soul and i think that more than before we need innovations that are meaningful to people that are meaningful to communities and to the world so so the work that i do i want people to understand is really really focused on future future stuff i work with inventors big thinkers people who want to um eradicate diseases you know really big big hairy goals um and so i want people to to keep that in mind you know i also work with 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 commodity businesses too but my my background is more about that yeah that's fantastic and yeah future stuff i like how you put that uh you're a futurist innovation uh and of course we don't have a crystal ball. We don't know what's necessarily coming down the pipeline, but we have some signals and we know trends and we can look and kind of project out. And, uh, you know, we never know exactly what the next disruption is going to be, uh, but we can try to prepare the best we can by just keeping a futures thinking mindset uh, around how we approach things. And so I, I think that's a fantastic background and and innovation is uh, keenly, you know, important right now as we move into the future of work. Um, let's start by just briefly talking a little bit about your book, Strategic Narrative. Uh, give us a little bit of a background to that, um, why this book, why now, why you decided to write this, um, and then we can start to get into, you know, these considerations for the future of business, society, and the planet. 
Well, this book is, first of all, it's a short book. And I, before I put, sorry, putting pen to paper, I, 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 I thought, what kind of book do, would I need to read? What, what book would I enjoy to uh, enjoy reading? And I thought, so I'm going to talk about the format first. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty tactical here. I thought, let's write a kid's book. I read countless number, you know, a, a countless amount of, of management books every year. And they're very long and you have to really be motivated to read them sometimes. But I wanted to write something that people can actually read in 13 minutes. I read, I read it on YouTube for people in 13 minutes. And um, one of the myths that I wanted to discuss is the difference between stories and narrative. I think in our business community, we were now used to word both terms kind of interchangeably. Um, you know, I'm sure you'll recognize that you, you, you have probably said at some point, hey, I want to tell my story. We have to have our story straight. Uh, our narrative needs to be clearer. Um, there is actually a difference between those two concepts. And that's what my book is about, is about... Um, narratives a system of stories uh, as as uh, as systems that bring in people in a more emotional way uh, we talk about the narrative about society about the economy about about justice um, already in a pretty advanced way i think that people who work in the social justice social change uh field will will you know have learned to really understand what the difference is to build better strategies to advance their agendas and i think the business community is a little behind on this uh on this curve you know we think and we see stories for the most part i'm going to i'm going to probably over generalize here but we think of stories as discrete entities cool stuff we want to put on social media to hook more people into buying our products Yes, that's one of the applications, but the, the use of storytelling can be much greater than that if you use it as something that will really mobilize people. One of the things I noticed in my career is that, you know, people would buy stories. They, you know, I, I worked in marketing positions and they would gladly pay for a story. But when you connect them with a narrative that is greater than just your, your organization, say, they will almost die for, for, for your cause, Right. And that's the type of energy, that's the type of movement we need as we, as we have to tackle big challenges, big adaptive changes, uh, you know, around us here in society, in the environment, in the way we treat each other. Uh, there are so many answers we don't have. And we can't be in that marketing, salesy kind of mode of storytelling for business that will sell more stuff anymore. We have to move on. And we have to understand that the way we create businesses now has really to do with the larger narrative that we we fuel as a society. So I'll pose here. Yeah, <laughs> but well, I, I really like that. I, I like uh, how you. Yeah, I like how you are focusing on narrative around. If I'm remembering correctly, you termed it a system of stories. Right. Um, and so rather than one off individual little stories that we're trying to tell you're weaving together this tapestry of stories into this systematic narrative yeah. to promote an overall you know vision mission purpose mm -hmm. um yeah. you know some sort of a change in the organization and society yeah. as a whole yeah. i i really really like that i think we generally speaking we need to learn how to think more in terms of systems uh yeah. than in terms of these one-off short-term kind of immediate um kind of activities you know we we often perform in terms of discrete activities and we don't integrate them into larger you know, long-term sustainable strategies right yeah that's right and that's uh, what you're describing here john is very relevant to people who um, who innovate most people think that innovation is coming up with a great idea a new concept great product and that's basically it add a add a layer of marketing on top of it and it's going to work right I think it's a lot more complex than this. There is a, there's a, there's an important nuance here. Innovation to me is invention plus adoption. And what most people miss is the adoption piece, right? And um, what I what I started seeing uh, many years ago is uh, is the difficulty we were running up against to really trigger adoption. So the book that I I put together this year is really written for the people who know that they have something amazing, that they know that they have something incredible to offer to, to their market, but just don't understand why is it that the market is not going to adopt it faster, <laughs> right? 
if let's 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 take an example here. Let's say I came up with a new brilliant source of renewable uh, renewable energy. Why is it that no that that it's going to take years and years for people to adopt it? So it's because we run up against underlying narratives that take time to understand, to change, to re-listen to, and to really integrate in the way we even design new products, new services. Uh, so there is this really this is really about this 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 problematic here of of adoption and alignment of causes and, and people. And um, so I, I publish on a you know frequent basis two to three times a week on my on my uh, newsletter. And and last night I wrote a short piece about um, the fact that you know it's like sailing. When you sail, you if, if you if you race with a boat, you can have the best boat, the best team, but really what make what what will probably make you win is your understanding of the underlying conditions, the the current. <laughs> I'm a sailor, and I used to uh, to to sail here in the Seattle area, and uh, in in the Seattle area on the Puget Sound. If you don't know the current, you can have the best boat. You will never you're you're never going to win. And so, in innovation, the game is very similar. You have to understand that if you're really putting something that is uh, disruptive, you are playing on an uneven playing field. <clears throat> Picture a rugby, say a rugby field or a tennis, you know, tennis field that is tilted, and you are at the bottom. You're on the you're on the lower end of that field, and you have to play against um, against somebody who has uh, very very uh, for for who it is very very easy to play, right? And so you have to understand how you can shift that balance in changing the narrative that the other player has in their mind. That's really what this, uh, that, what this approach is about. So the following question is, how do we do this? Because, you know, these are the grand concepts, you know, the philosophy, but how do we do this? And I laid out, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm proposing a framework uh, with four different pieces that go beyond just simple marketing. It's actually, it actually integrates leadership as well. I feel like really to change narrative, you have to have, uh, to have, to have, visionary leadership yeah. as a practice in place. Yeah, yeah. Let's so dig in, let's dig into that. What are those four core elements um that help us to bring this kind of from these abstract philosophies and ideas down into the day-to-day -day practical application? So the first thing to consider is what I call visionary leadership. It's really your ability to uh not only shape a vision but also nourish it and 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 live through it. You know, great leaders um, uh, that build narrative power start with a vision that they can shape, that they can really fuel uh, over and over. And that takes a lot of personal strength because if you're really about something that is innovative, you will probably feel a little bit like an anomaly. You will you will hear pushbacks. It's going to be hard to um, get people on your on your side. And that's where the best marketing can do a lot, but can't replace your guts and can't replace your courage and can't replace the human element of innovation. I'm sure that will ring a bell with you, John. Um, but that's the first area here. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, absolutely agree. And so if I'm, you know, if I'm a listener and I'm not really familiar with the innovation space and I'm thinking, okay, how do I actually put that into practice today any any ideas or tips on how i could start to do that right now vision comes from the inside you have to start journaling and documenting your journey most people most inventors once they've they, they've released their their first minimally minimally viable product uh forgot about why they even started with this in the in the first place or they have a way to say it that is not very compelling that is that is a little bit um fuzzy because they're so focused on the future that they, they don't have a chance to look at the past. So document your journey. Where does this vision come, for, uh, uh, come from? What are the defining moments that you went through? And why did it matter to you? Therefore, why does it matter to people? You can have the great, you know, the greatest yeah. vision that makes you excited, but if it doesn't make anyone else excited, then it's worthless. So it's really a a, a work of introspection, of journaling, yeah. of 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 really exploring your 
interior world. I'll leave it at that for now. Yeah. And th that's something we talk about a lot on this podcast for a lot of different topics, <laughs> you know, introspection, journaling, critical self-analysis, like that is hugely important to just personal growth, leadership development, our capacity to better understand ourselves and others around us so we can have more influence and and so that we can empower those around us on our teams, et cetera. But it definitely applies to innovation. Let's, let's uh, document the process. Let's Absolutely. journal. Let's go through that introspective process and to build a habit of it. And, and the great innovators, uh, like you said, people who are able to, you know, have a good idea, but also, you know, go towards implementation and adoption of that idea. Those great innovators, those are ones that are continually pushing themselves, challenging themselves and, and having some sort of mechanism to go through that introspective process. I love the word mechanism. I see visionary leadership, not as a trait, not as a, as an attribute of someone, but as a process and a practice. Therefore you can learn it, you can apply it and you can get better at it. Yeah. Awesome. All oh, right. Uh, yeah. Second, uh, second two, two through four. <laughs> two through four is meaningful marketing. And you're going to, people tell me, well, I'm not a marketer. What, what do you mean marketing? Like we, what, what is that? They're looking at me like, yes, you are a marketer. <laughs> Depending on which definition you have of marketing. To me, marketing is the art of helping your business find its calling so again, that's, there is the idea of a process here, of a journey. What is marketing? It's bringing an idea to a market, a group of people, whether it's a community, an industry, and so on, and really tying to where is it that these people are ready to go? Where, are you wanna, where do you want to take them? And that's way beyond your company. I see so many um, entrepreneurs focus on marketing as this really uh, narrow-minded activity of just pushing stuff about their product and services all the time. That's not marketing. That, that's spam. <laughs> Mark is really marketing is really about um, aligning the purpose of your company with the purpose of your market. So first of all, you have to take the time to understand what is it that the market is interested in in, in doing, right? What what is it that the market is ready to accept? So narrative powers will develop when your company's purpose is also aligned to your market's purpose. So very practically speaking, what does it what does it look like? If you don't spend a little bit of time every day, personally, even as even if you're the CEO of a large corporation, even if you think, oh, yeah, I've got, I got people doing this for me. No, you need to do it yourself. You need to be at least leading the process to really understand what the market is about and, and where is it that you want to have impact. Um, I, I see more and more also one, one other characteristic of this, uh, of this practice is the, the, the transparency piece. In the future, we're going to have to be way more transparent about the product that we put together, the, the way we develop them. And the latest example of that, it was la uh, this week, I think earlier this week, uh, the uh, French ski manufacturer, Rosignol, it's you know pretty well-known brand here in the U.S., uh, uh, came up this year with the very first uh, recyclable skis. So first of all, I learned that skis were not recyclable before. But they came up with a brilliant idea to make a recyclable ski. And now they're saying, well, we just released the composition of that ski. We're giving you all the specs for free. It's not patented. We, and please, competitors, feel free to copy us because we want, we want society, we want everyone to focus on building a, a circular economy. So that is leadership right there in, in, the, in marketing. So that is meaningful. That's my definition of meaningful marketing right there with an example. So do that. Tesla yeah. did it. Um, I, I love that. And, you know, people are, are thinking, well, why in the world would you give up your competitive advantage by sharing that information? And I think it's just a reframing of what matters most, right? It is actually your competitive advantage to give up your competitive advantage. <laughs> it still is. I think. I think in the future it will be. It will become more of the norm. Yeah, and it's it's a it's a mindset shift towards more of an ongoing, long term, sustainable approach to your competitive advantage and your organization success, rather than the short term, you know, quarterly earnings report and et cetera, et cetera. In transaction, yeah. So, uh, very practically, ask yourself this question as you're as you're listening to this podcast. What are you willing to give up if you're so serious about the impact and the purpose you want, you, you you say you're having? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I mean, excellent. One, 
one of the many questions I could I could talk I could talk all day long about this. I <laughs> But that's one of the key ones. Third, third one is, um, you know, it's really going back to the internal side of the organization is like, how do you team purposefully? So the, my, my third dimension here is called purposeful teaming. And the best team typically rally around very core and strong values. So if you have not developed the perspective that you defend, that you, you've, you, 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 you've, you've really taken the time to craft, the point of view that will rally your team, um, you're really behind. Purposeful teaming start by really infusing that idea of let's build a team as a movement. Like if people really understand what is it that we're doing here beyond just transactional day-to-day, -day, you know, cramming our schedules with meaningless meaning kind of stuff, um, you've got much more narrative power. What's going to happen is that you're going to have people um, really banging at your door to work with you. Uh, and, and one of the questions I ask when I work with, with some of the entrepreneurs I work with is, do you have a pipeline of diehard fans that are that are that, that send you their resume, even though they don't seem qualified, but they really, really want to work with you because they feel like their values are so aligned? And yeah, it's like oh, that's a good question. Yeah, we have a few folks, but I say, well, we we should really work on this. And the way we work on this is not by going out there and putting more um, uh, advertisement for recruiting. Is first of all by defining what is the experience in our team, like what are the values. Yeah. We and how do we walk the talk? Really, it's about that. So I'll, I'll give you an example. It's an old example, but something that really worked effectively. In 1959, uh, Volvo was um, was a was positioned on the market as a you know fa family sports family slash sports car. They were pretty undifferentiated, and um, the president lost a relative in a car accident and decided that he, his responsibility was to put on the market safer cars. So he reshaped. So first of all, he recruited an expert in um, uh, hands bowling. He was working at Saab at the time, uh, manufacturing uh, safety uh, mechanisms for aircraft. And he 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 poached. He, he you know he recruited or poached him. I don't know the details, but and then reshaped the entire team around core values on engineering. And there are diehard engineer engineers, you know, ready to whether the pushbacks of the market and the time that it takes to adopt the three-point seatbelt um, invention um, and really, really build a very strong team of engineers. And, and today, I mean, the lasting effect of the decisions are are still here, uh, what, like um, 60 years later, <laughs> Volvo is still known for this reputation of safety. So th these are these are some ex of the examples. So Start today. What is the purpose yeah. that you're instilling in your team? And if you feel like some people don't align with that purpose, well, you've got to make maybe, you know, they've got to move on or you have to move on, but you have to make some, some tough decisions here. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. All right. So I think always we want to have some alignment, some congruency within our teams. There's a whole lot of positive benefits mm -hmm. to having, um, you know, that alignment to having that shared culture to, to focusing on employee experience and the experience of team members within the team mm -hmm. uh, so that you can attract and retain great people. Um, but it leads to better innovation. It leads to better solutions to the most challenging problems that we face. And so again, if we're going to try to tackle the biggest messy issues in business society in the world today, then we need to have teams that are up to the task. And that means we have to have good people who are jointly pursuing the same common goal. They have values, alignment, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Well, well, well said, well reframed. I mean, you know, in my intro, you asked me um, to talk about the context and the background of my book. Really, I, I, I forgot to mention something, which is this is really for companies who have a transformative agenda. And transformation is tough. If you are in, if you are seeking transformation in your market, in your industry, in your community, or even at the individual level with your with your customer or, or a consumer, however you want to call them, um, you have to you have to have the right team behind it. So many companies say, "Yeah, we are going to transform this," but they don't have the right people behind. They don't have the right mindset behind. So that's really what this third out of four dimension is about. So good. Yeah, let's go to number four. Um, the, so 
number four is like, okay, all of that. So <laughs> I'll mimic a conversation that I have sometime with people. They go, hey, Guillaume, very good. I love it. Yes inspiring but hey we sell products here i'm like yes that's my fourth one <laughs> authentic selling authentic selling is the key here if you've done the three first step right you should now be at a point where you've realigned who you are as a leader your connection with the market and your team so you should be in a position to lie less about your product so many lies so much pressure fear of missing out all of these are outdated concepts. What people want is authenticity. They want the truth. They they don't and 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 they've got so much technology now to find out about the truth even before you realize that you were lying. <laughs> so don't even so stop stop that game. Be in the mode of authentically selling what people want, what people um, buy and that's easy to do once you've explained to them why um, the innovation that you have is useful to them what is why it's meaningful why is it that they need it today <laughs> right so authentic authentic selling is about the the pursuit of less effort in your sales effort right less marketing less sales budget is here's a question i have for you here on this podcast would your product be really missed if you stop selling it um how reliant are you on big sales and marketing budgets to actually uh you know have your company operate so what if you didn't have a marketing or sales budget anymore would you would you uh go bankrupt okay maybe it in some context where regulations are such that you can't do anything else fine but so many areas, so many new markets are just um, free right now, and uh, so you have to you have to ask yourself like, is our product so good, so well positioned, so true, so honest and transparent that it kind of sells itself? That's the key question here. That's one of the principles yeah. I defend. So what do you do now? Let's let, let's get into the in, into the how do we do that? Well. You have to work on your product story. And the product story is not the product, the, the story that you make up as a, as a sales or marketing person. I mean, you, you can do that in your closet all day long. That's great. You're going to be very excited about it and think it's going to work and so on. No, it's the story that people have in their head. That's what you need to go listen to. <laughs> That's what you need to go figure out by having more conversations with them and by really aligning with how are they going to use it? I mean, I'm I'm, so, I'm always so um, struck by when you when you do that kind of stuff, when you do authentic selling, is how much we discover about how people you actually use uh, products, some products and services, how they actually, um, yeah, what what how how do they reframe the usage, the the value of some of some of some of the products and services that we put out, uh, out there in the market. So if you have, if you're running up against, if you don't know what you're running up against, look at this area, right? How do you sell your products today? How much effort do you have to put yeah. into this? Yeah, this is wonderful. Makes, sense, makes perfect sense. Uh, okay. And this has just been a really great, quick. Uh, and dirty crash course into this. We could go on and on and on. I also note yep. the time and I'm going to have to let you go here in just a minute. Yes. Um, so I really appreciate you laying this out for us. And of course you have a, a great book uh, that can help people as they want to uh, further pursue this. Uh, and before we wrap things up for today, I just wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience how they, to let them know how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, if they want to continue the conversation and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Yeah, um, so very practically, go to my website. My website is metahelm.com, M-E-T-A-H-E-L-M. Um, there's one thing you can do there that will take five minutes. I have an assessment that will tell you uh, today if you're building narrative power for your company. Uh, there are 12, 12 easy to understand, not so easy to answer sometimes questions there. And so take that assessment. So you'll get your results immediately and you will, and then it follows with some resources to know what to do. So that's for the uh, you know the call to action here is is really to go to that website metahealth.com and do the assessment and it comes with the with the with the book for free as well. One of the final words I want to leave people with is that um, is really probably around the, you know scarcity mindset. All everything I told you about only works if you embrace abundance as a mindset. 
look ahead, look forward. There are so many possibilities. I know we hear scary stuff happening on the planet today, but there is also so many great news, so many great inventions, idea, innovations. So go, go look after these and rally the movements that um, that are building around these ideas. That's what I'll I'll say. Wonderful. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. I encourage my audience to reach out, get connected, find out more uh, about what you can do for them. And, and as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page. And please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.